I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, 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 oh. I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. Crystal Mitchell, do you have my business plan? Just reveal the pages of my marketing plan. Crystal Mitchell, do you have my business plan? And good afternoon and welcome to the Business Zone with Crystal and Gilbert. Uh, Today, Gilbert is uh, not here. He's not in the studio. He is actually uh, in Las Vegas working on his contract that he does every week. So uh, generally, uh, we, we we miss him when he's away. And then he comes back and he razzles and dazzles us. So we're going to hold that hold down the court until he comes back next week. So he'll be back here next week. So we've got uh, some great, uh, great guests here today. It's myself and my guest today. I don't even have a guest co-host today, but that's OK. We're going to do this the way we do this. Um, let's see what has gone on this week. Uh, for those of you that are tuning into the Business Zone for the first time, this is a this is a program that is here for our small businesses, our growth businesses our corporations. It's the place that we're bringing our businesses together, our entrepreneurs together uh, to meet with supplier diversity and, and making sure that they're contract ready. And it is to show that it's full of information, full of resources, and full of amazing guests that are bringing their expert expertise to you so that you can become a better business person or become a business person. So we're really excited about the program. We've been out. We've actually been launched now for almost 10 months. That's absolutely amazing. Yay. So we've been able to hold it down and we're looking forward for our anniversary and all the other um, exciting people that will be on the show in the upcoming months. Uh, Let's see. This week, Active Week, Monday was my birthday. So everyone say happy birthday to me. I had a great time and I will be celebrating for the whole entire month of May. So you can continue to reach out and wish me happy birthday. Take me out for lunch. Take me out for drinks. Take me out for dinner. I will be open to all of it. And let's see what else we got going on. I, I did my orientation this week. You know, Gilbert and I have a contract with Mount SAC, which is... um. Uh, Mount San Antonio Community College and I teach a bookkeeping class, a fundamental bookkeeping class to uh, rep, uh, recipients that are part of the social services programs. And we're teaching them how uh, to, acquire, I'm teaching them skill sets so that they can become uh, more um, successful uh, in creating money and increasing their incomes to take care of their families. So I met with my new students for this semester and there are about 17 of them. And so I'm looking forward to that. I start Monday. Not looking forward to the drive to Cerritos every single uh, Monday through Wednesday, but uh, but I love the I love teaching and I love sharing my knowledge and my and the programs and the services and and the uh, skill sets that I have with other people. So so far we've had 100 percent placement rate rate with everyone that has participated in the program. So I, and this group, wow, I was really amazed and blown away with the skills that they already have so looking for the same thing for them for the upcoming for them when they complete and they should all be able to find fantastic jobs as well what else do we have uh in the news this week um which really affects all of us as much as it does on the east coast and in dc hey lorna hey john how are you welcome to facebook live um well the affordable health care act wow Okay, we we rolled that back. We don't want anybody to have health insurance. I guess we want all the Americans, with the exception of the very, very wealthy, to be alive and the rest of us just to disappear from this planet. I don't know if they know if we're not here as their consumers that their wealth will disappear because no one will be buying their products or services if we're not here. I don't think they got that just yet, but that's the way it works. They're not buying from each other. So the only people that would be buying their their products or going to their stores or putting money in their banks would be us. So it really makes no sense to me why we're trying to get rid of the um, 
the uh, middle class and the poor people. But it is what it is. Let's see what we have. Our wonderful Ben Carson, he has decided that private public housing should not be cozy. People shouldn't get comfortable there. Uh, they should be able to be motivated to get up and get out. OK, no programs, no services to help them do that. But don't get cozy in your pro in your public housing like anybody would. Right. Really dumb. Uh, what else has gone on? They made a big stink about Obama. He, I guess he's the only president, the only formal president that should not come away from the White House and make any money. Uh, he's they're really upset that he uh, um, was paid a four hundred thousand dollar speaking engagement fee. Uh, that shouldn't happen to him. I think one of the uh, the um, I want to say that's Ryan or was someone that actually feels that he should eliminate only President Obama's pension because he's going to be making so much money now that he's a former president that he does not deserve to have his pension. But the rest of them can have their pension. Really insane government that we're working with right now. Hello, everyone on Facebook Live. My niece, hi, Iman or Tierney. Tierney celebrated her birthday on May 2nd. Happy birthday, sweetheart. Hey, William Byers, how are you? Kathy Hendricks, welcome to the Business Zone. We're glad to have you. If you want to see the full show, you will, should go over to morrismedialive.com and uh, check us out. We stream live there at, as well. And then that way you can see my guest who's going to be on very, very shortly. Um, and actually, I think we're going to bring him on now because it's just me. And I think Let's we can it. go on and get started and then we can get ready with a commercial afterwards. But... I am going to introduce you to an amazing man. I want to say I met Bill at a festival. I'm not quite sure where we met, but years ago I met him and I was very impressed because there's not many African-American business owners that you meet that are actually in the wholesale business that are actually have a product on the shelves of a supermarket. I haven't met them. Maybe you guys have. But when I met Bill, I was very, very impressed. His name is Bill Washington. He hails from New Orleans. He's a native. His family is there in Baton Rouge. Uh, as we speak, I think, uh, there when, um, uh, uh, Katrina. We had Hurricane Katrina. They actually had to relocate and take up new residents in, in Baton Rouge. He's a former accountant, so he and I have a lot in common hmm. there. And that may be why we struck it. I, I remember him so well when I first met him. He is a former accountant. He escaped from the corporate America world. He started his whole food, uh, his wholesale food business in the Bay Area 20 years ago. His Creole potato salad, you all have probably had his Creole potato salad. It, it was the fasting selling food item in Albertson's supermarket in their whole entire deli history. So that's saying a lot. And his journey from Burb from a Bourbon Street doorman to a USC graduate mm -hmm. to a wholesale food co company owner to uh, being profiled on many television studio stations, NBC, CBS, ABC, TV. And now he is here in the studio with us on the Business Zone. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for coming and thank you for being a guest. Thank you. My pleasure. Is, by, the, by the way, yes. we also met through Harold Hambrick. Who oh, was a we? good friend of mine who used oh, to do the Black okay. Expo. I was thinking yeah. today when I before I got here to the show, I was like, how did I meet Bill? I remember, I know I've known you for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. And I think it, even before I became the co-director of Recycling Black Dollars, actually. Well, I think we had met before then. Okay. But I think through Harold, we kind of had a chance to talk. Okay. And then from there, we just kind of clicked. And I, I think I did something at the... Urban. I gave a speech at the Urban League Youth Entrepreneurs thing that you helped me okay. to get in on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then that must be it because I couldn't quite. I was trying to place you as to where we met and how we met. All I remember was that uh, you were an accountant, and of course I was in the uh, uh, bookkeeping mm -hmm. and accounting field. So that always helps me remember people because okay. you know that's not rare that uh, you have a business owner that actually was an accountant before, which is a real asset. Man. <laughs> oh, it, it, it is as much as I have to admit, as much as I disliked accounting when I was in it. Uh huh. But once I got out of it, I realized 
Oh, wow. I understand business. Yeah, there you go. That's that's the real treat. Yeah. I mean, accounting, if you think about it, accounting, the definition of accounting is accounting. You're accounting for the money in the business. Right. And business is either money coming in or money going out. And who accounts for that but the accountant. So you get to see everything that's happening with a business. Right, exactly. So that gives us a heads up oh, as yeah. we understand the financial structure of a business is more is is paramount to the success of a business. Oh yeah, because you got to know how the money's coming in, and then all the rest of that kind of falls around to it and, and falls in place. But really, that's the most important thing. Oh, so absolutely. if you got a heads up on that one, that that puts you leaps and bounds above a lot of our business owners that are out there today. Yeah, because if I, I used to be a consultant for the city of San Francisco for those trying to get their products into supermarkets. Okay. And I met people with fantastic products. And this was in the hood in San Francisco. Okay. You know, San Francisco was in Hunters Point. And people with great products, but they weren't business-minded. And they just disappeared. Yeah, because if you don't have that. Uh, hi, Leo. Today, our topic, we're actually, I don't know if you know New Orleans Bill. He's a food, a wholesale food uh company owner and we are talking about how you go from wholesaling into the supermarket so that's our conversation today so stay tuned leo go to morris media live and or call in leo we'd love to have you call in so bill tell me what was that journey so what corporation first did you work for oh well in the san francisco bay area i worked for uh crown zellerbach uh, Children's Hospital. Um, oh, God. And you were in their accounting department? Yeah. Um, at Children's Hospital, they were they were building a new hospital. And to get government funding, they had to account for every dollar, penny That's that right. was spent. Exactly. So my job was to account for every dollar, penny okay. that was spent. So and now how did that all matriculate or ch move you into the potato salad <laughs> industry and the whole food industry, wholesale food industry? Well, you know, I, like I said, I wasn't really into accounting. I mean, I did it, mm -hmm. um, but I was also a promoter. I used to promote basketball tournaments, uh, banquets, dances for black community groups. Okay. And one thing I used to do was I had a um, scholarship benefit basketball tournament and dance involving the black accountants, the black engineers, the black doctors, the black bankers, the black MBAs, all the black groups. And it was also a role model event mm -hmm. where um, we would bring the kids in from the Little League mm -hmm. and show them, hey, look, we all played sports, blah, 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 blah. But we also graduated. So now we're accountants, doctors, lawyers, engineers, bankers. Right. And we didn't just fall on the wayside when our sports career didn't go all the way. Okay. And, and interacting with the uh, caterers in these events, I noticed, like, wait a minute. Their food is different okay. from the food I'm used to. Okay. Me coming from New Orleans. So I always wanted to get into the food in. And one thing I discovered was, there's restaurants, there's mm -hmm. caterers, but there's hundreds, thousands of supermarkets around. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, being an accountant, I'm like, wait a minute, why should I spend my money and time with one restaurant or catering when if I could get my product in one of those stores, I could get it in thousands of stores? And that would make more sense. <laughs> so... I knew I knew I had something because the minute I got off the plane in California from New Orleans mm -hmm. 20 plus years ago, people found out, oh, you're from New Orleans. Oh, can you cook this? Can you cook that? They were telling me about food. <laughs> and I'm like, why are these people asking me about food? Because at the time, I didn't know New Orleans food was different. I oh, thought everybody yeah. ate like New Orleans we ate. food is different. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found out. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to see if I can get this stuff in the stores. I had no idea, no clue as to what was involved. I had nobody to go to okay. as a mentor or anything. So I just I learned by trial and error. And one thing I knew, though, was my family had this potato salad. And even in New Orleans, they would ask us for potlucks and church dinners and events, whatever. Uh -huh. They'd always tell us, you guys bring that potato salad, that potato salad. 
So I figured, well, you know what, let me try to see if I can do something with this potato salad. So I did like the little rappers, the young rappers did, where they always have their tapes in their cars and stuff. <laughs> you peddled on the street, I potato, your potato hey, salad on the street. <laughs> I had a cooler, <laughs> a potato salad in the trunk of my car, and I just go everywhere giving out samples. Okay. And everybody loved it. Everybody loved it. And so I figured, you know what, let me do some more research. I found out that potato salad is not a sexy, jazzy, exciting product. No. But it's one of the biggest sellers in those supermarket delis. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because almost every culture eats potato salad. They do. They do. Yeah, that's actually right. So it's one of the biggest sellers. So I was like, okay, all right, well, let me give it a try. And a 20-year story, uh, that salad became the fastest-selling food item. And this is the Hollywood version of the story, of course. Okay. It became the fastest-selling food item in Albertson's Deli history up in Northern California in the Bay Area where, you know, it's about green and organic and right, all exactly. that stuff. Healthy, very, very bohemian up there. But my salad just knocked all that stuff out. And I had it in every major supermarket chain up there. I mean, I had Costco, Safeway, Albertsons. I mean, you name a supermarket chain. I had it up there. The next thing I know, the supermarkets... In Southern California, they started calling me. Oh man, that's a that's that's, a, a, that's where you want to be, right? Them calling you, not you calling yeah. them to beg to go on the shelves. Yeah. They're, they're the way they're begging you to be on their shelves. But that's unusual. But I said, okay, all right, all right, let's do it. But one thing that helped was um, the media got a hold of what I was doing. Okay. And next thing you know, they were just the uniqueness. Of who's this guy with this New Orleans potato salad in all these supermarkets? And also, my stuff is called Creole potato salad, where back 20 years ago, everybody was talking about New Orleans and Cajun food. Right. Not knowing that really New Orleans food is actually Creole cooking. Cajun is Louisiana country cooking. Okay. But in New Orleans, we did Creole cooking. So it was kind of like, Everybody's asking, well, who's this guy from New Orleans talking about his food is Creole, it's not Cajun? And then when they saw <clears throat> what I look like, uh -huh. it, it made them even more interested. Oh, who's this brother? Got the products in the stores. So next thing I knew, NBC TV, ABC TV, CBS, BET, Black Enterprise, uh, San Francisco Examiner, Oakland Tribune, all these people were calling me. Wow. About doing the story. Uh huh. So once that story hit, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, my salad, I mean, it just really took off. Wow. And then, so just one, at that time, just one product. Salad. One product. That's that, potato salad. But it, but it shows you how big the supermarkets are. Right. Where even with one product, but you got to really know how to work one product, though. Yes. You can make a living. You can make a, a decent living off of one product. But you really got to know how to work it. You've got to you got to find your niche because mm -hmm. it's all about finding a niche. Because the big boys will uh, uh, how should I be diplomatic? The big boys will see what you're doing and uh, kind of push you out. No, they will diplomatically. Um, <clears throat> they'll make their version of your product. Ah, they're I'm duplicate. being diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> they duplicate, huh? Uh, yeah. and that's what happened to me. Okay, so they duplicated it to read to to push you to create a competitive uh, product so, to push you out of business, basically. Yeah. So I I got a phone call one day, and this is all like sixteen years ago. Uh huh. From Albertsons, I mean from Albertsons Northern Cal, and they said, Bill, uh, we've got all these big companies offering us their version of your Creole potato salad. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, Creole potato salad, they all have their version of it, and they're offering it to us at cheaper prices. And I'm like, but how can they do that? There's, there's really no such thing as Creole potato salad. That's a name I gave it because I'm from New Orleans. Right. In New Orleans, we do Creole cooking. So how can they have their version of my Creole potato salad? Long story short, they can. Ah. And there's nothing you can do about it. Because you really can't 
trademark or copyright food, right? No, no. Because I, I mean, because it's so it's so subjective to your own culture, and yeah. you know, you could do a pinch here or, or exactly. a dash of food here, but it doesn't always. It's not always the same every time you do it, right? So yeah. there, th there's no way Creole means a lot to a lot of exactly. different people, right? Exactly. Wow. Creole can mean New Orleans or Louisiana cooking. It can mean uh, African American cooking in Louisiana and New Orleans. Right. It could also mean European cooking in Louisiana and New Orleans. Right. And it can also mean Caribbean cooking. Yeah. Okay. So um, you really you can't do anything about it. You've got to protect your brand, your name, not so much the product, but you got to protect your name because you just can't. Right. You can't protect the name of the product. It's impossible. Of, of the food itself. Right. Of the food. food. So I'm going to, my, my um, New Orleans uh, food experience, uh, my girlfriend used to work for the uh, airlines. She worked for uh, Continental. And so she had flight benefits and I was her companion on her um on her uh, for her flight uh, benefits so we would go to New Orleans regularly but the very first time I went there that was my very first time ever being in New Orleans mm. so she had been doing this because she'd been with the airlines for a number of years so when she got there she had a routine we'd go to certain places and she'd buy a muffalata that would be mm. the, that's her first thing when on the plane that she couldn't wait to get to a muffalata and then we had she had her other key favorite places to eat there so I really had you know I've had new I've had people who who are from New Orleans cook for me but eh, it's food it's a whole different thing in the state of Louisiana or in the city of Louis oh, New yeah. Orleans yeah. I had french fries and when I came back to LA I had french fries at the House of Blues I could eat no french fries <laughs> for about a year because I don't know what they did with it's something about the seasoning I think that's the secret right well, that's the secret <laughs> It's the seasoning, and also to me, it's it's the different cultures in New Orleans. New Orleans was a seaport town, right? So you had different cultures coming to New Orleans from all over the world. Okay. And New Orleans being such a party town, a lot of people came and they would eat and they would drink, and they all had food, right? So you had you had the Italians, you had the Spanish, you had the African, you had the French. And all those cultures kind of blended together. So when you got all those cultures blending together with food, especially uh -huh. down south, right. that's going to make some dynamic food. Yeah. But one thing a lot of the public doesn't know is all that gumbo and jambalaya and all that great food out of New Orleans, uh -huh. guess where it all originated? Africa. Exactly. Right, exactly. Because that's the major influence right there is the African influence. Right? Oh, yeah. And Senegal, to mm -hmm. be more specific, because a lot of the slave trade came from Senegal because the slaves, the people in Senegal did rice growing and rice planting. Okay. And in Louisiana, they wanted to be able to plant rice and that heat and all that stuff. So it made sense for them to get people from Senegal to do it. Oh, okay. So they brought the gumbo and the jumbo lie. If you go to Senegal, you'll see the words that mean gumbo and jumbo lie in Senegal. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. There's a guy, uh, there's a brother down in, he's either in New Orleans or he's in South Carolina who has a whole history of all this stuff. I mean, it's fantastic what he knows and everything he tells you makes all the sense in the world. And it just shows you how, wow, all that great stuff came from Africa. And Africans got no credit for it. And he's written books. But like most black businesses, he's undercapitalized and underfunded. Mm -hmm. So he, he hasn't really gotten the book out there a lot. Uh -huh. But I, I can't remember his name. But Dillard University down in New Orleans, um, I got introduced to him through them because Ray Charles gave Dillard University millions of dollars to preserve the culture and the history oh, really? of black Creole cooking. Oh, wow. I yeah. didn't know that either. Yeah, because it's dying. I mean, the young, the, young, the young black people in New Orleans, to me, in my opinion, okay. are not picking up 
the the legacy and the tradition of the Creole well, that, cooking. That is the history of that. Yeah. Of that and the music. Yeah. The, yeah. The jazz music and all that. They're not picking it up. They want to do rap and hip hop, which is their generation's music. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that's big parts of our culture. Well, actually, then, for you guys, I don't know. Did you ever see the series that came out about two years after uh, Hurricane Katrina? It was, uh, was it uh, Tresem Tresemme? Was oh, Treme. Treme. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a uh, that was an amazing series. And it did help with the cult, you know, for those that have never been to New Orleans. But the music is just paramount uh, oh, yeah. to, to, to that environment. But the food is the other half of it. Yeah. And um, when I haven't been back to New Orleans since... Uh, uh, Katrina, but before, I mean, that was what drove you. That was what brought you there. Was and I'm not even a seafood eater. I, I'm really? allergic to most seafood, but it was everything else. You know, the beignets. I mean, the whole thing <laughs> is just like wow. And if I, I guess if I had been a, if I had ate seafood, it would be a whole different story. But my girlfriends and everybody did. But we went down there like two or three times every year. In fact, I think we have a trip. We're thinking trying to get down there in the next month, couple of months, or before the end of the year. Well, you know, New Orleans, I mean, there's so much food. Um, well, take, for example, my Creole potato salad. Right. I have no culinary training, no chef school, nothing. Okay. And here I have the fastest selling food item in Albertsons, the second largest supermarket chain in the country. I have this... The, the fastest selling food item in the deli history. So it's just what from was New Orleans. from New Orleans and what was passed down from generation to generation. Now, let me ask this question. Being in New Orleans, being in Louisiana, from the different regions, uh, does the food change? Oh, yeah. The, and oh, the yeah. seasoning and how they prepare the food oh, yeah. changes and the taste? Yeah. Um, okay, now I got to be careful. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> <With this> <laughs> you don't hurt nobody's feelings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the food in New Orleans is different from the food in most of the rest of Louisiana. Okay. Because, again, New Orleans was a seaport town. And okay. it sat right on the, you know, the right Gulf, and, the Gulf, Gulf right. and the Mississippi River and all that. So, again, you had all those influences from all over the, the world. Right. But the farther away you got from New Orleans, the less those influences were in place or different influences were in place. Okay. Like, for instance— the farther away you got from New Orleans, the more the Cajun influence was okay. in place. All righty. I can okay. see that. And I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to get into trouble. Okay. Cajun versus Creole. But um, New Orleans, well, you'd have to kind of, they're like cousins. It's like your mama and your daddy and your cousins. It's all family, but your cousins who live 100 miles from here may cook something a little different, even though it's the same food you cook, they'll right. cook it a little different than you cooked it. Okay. Because of where you live and where they live. Okay. And it's the same thing. But now, especially since Hurricane Katrina uh -huh. has hit and everybody's kind of scattered oh. all over the place from New Orleans. Has that I made can, a big change? It's made some somewhat of a change. It's like the native New Orleanians can tell the difference between okay. New Orleans cooking and the cooking from the rest of Louisiana. But most, if you're not from there, you probably couldn't tell the difference. Okay. And it's like, like next weekend, I'm doing a, it's called a Gator at the Bay Festival in in San Diego. Okay. And I'll just be giving out samples of my Creole potato salad. And see, that's that's going to be a Louisiana lover's crowd. Oh, okay. So you're going you're gonna to be very popular next week, huh? Oh, yeah. And I'm also going to be bombarded with questions <laughs> about some of the stuff like we are talking about. <laughs> but... Actually, now I know how I how I met you. It was at a black expo. And I think I came up to a table that you had your potato salad as a sample. And I don't know. I want to say that was a black expo that um, Natalie Cole, Natalie Cole from the uh, Business Weekly. It was a couple of years, about four or five, about four years ago. Oh, the one where, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of people there. So <laughs> so, so we got to get, we really got, got to, to know the other right. vendors That's really right. well. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you were there and how yeah. it was there. But, and and uh, I think that's how I met you. I think so. Did yeah. you say that? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, because I was trying to think where, because I know I had your potato salad. And I remember having, when I look at you, I think, it was in a little cup. Now, where would I have gotten a little cup of potato salad? 
<laughs> and he was there, and that's where it was. It was at that black business. That's the very first one, because yeah. be, uh, Recycling Black Dollars was a vendor as well. Yeah, we know what I think. I was living in, in Oakland at the time. Yeah, you to, didn't live here. No, and I used to enjoy coming down to L.A. to do events and stuff. Because then you used to do the event. Remember the big, uh, we had the Black Expo that was um, at the end around Labor Day weekend. And that would have been Harold's. That, that was Harold. Oh, yeah. Weren't you here during that time, too? OK, because oh, that. Yeah. yeah. And Harold got him. They connected with Natalie trying to duplicate that because he had to move it from there because it just got so crazy costly. And you know what? Speaking of Harold, I mean, Harold's my buddy. Harold's uncle and I were business partners okay. in New Orleans. OK. And I actually grew up. Two doors down. I'm talking about Harold Hambrick for those yeah, who don't yeah, know. And Harold, Harold has left us, and yeah. he was a phenomenal, a very a presence, very much missed in Los Angeles. Yeah, and I grew up two doors down from his aunt, so I knew the whole family. Okay. And the last name Hambrick, when I first got out here, and I saw the name Hambrick. I mean, there's not that many Hambricks around. No. no. I, I I said, wait a minute, Hambrick. And I did some research and come to find out, oh, yeah, uh, that's my business partner's cousin, first cousin, no, uncle. Oh, wow. So, and Harold and I just hit it. We just hit it off. Oh, yeah, right Harold away. is really, really cool. Oh, yeah. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk about Harold because, you know, Harold, I did not know, and I did not know how influential and how connected he was still was to New Orleans and to his services when the people that came to talk and to pay honor and tribute to him, his memory, I did not know he was that connected. So when we come Amen. back, we'll talk about that. So we're going to take a, a break for a few minutes. For those of you uh, that want to see the show, um, broadcasting live at morrismedialive.com. And if you have any questions, please call in at 323-293-3375. And we'll be back in a moment. Hmm. Hello, meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186.
like a New Orleans song. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to get you to feel mm -hmm. so you felt at home mm -hmm. here in the, in the studio with the, <laughs> with the business zone. But you feel at home. So tell me, what is the pr prog? What's the steps? And what were your steps? Because it actually seemed like. It just was meant to be for you to be there. But what are the normal steps to actually create a product, get that park product to marketplace, but into a supermarket? Okay. And I'm going to keep it real. Okay. Yeah, okay. keep it real. That's what we want. Yeah, our community needs to hear that. Um, number one, everybody's got a product or someone in their family who's got some pie or some dish that they prepare that everybody raves about. And what's the first thought in their minds? Ooh, that should be in the store so you can make some money. Right. Because it tastes good. Right. So what's the reality of that? The reality is when you're cooking at home, that's cooking. When you step outside of home, it's the food business. And it's a whole different world. It's about business. Okay. Um. I'm going to stick to the, the supermarket part as opposed okay. to a restaurant or catering because that's what I do. I sell okay. to the supermarkets. Um, if you think about it, okay, your product tastes great. But if your product, if you're lucky enough to get it on the shelves in the supermarket, um, how does somebody know how good it is? They can't taste it if it's sitting on the shelf in the right. store. And there's so many other products that are sitting right around side of it. That's really your competitor, right? So how do you get them to go to pick up your product exactly. versus the product exactly. sitting next door to it? Okay. But I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit, though. But okay. let me back up a little bit. Um, okay, first thing you got to do, I advise everybody, um, you have to know what it costs you to make mm. this product. <laughs> so in other words, first thing you need to do is go see an accountant. That's mm. the first Even before you go see an attorney. <laughs> Go really? see an account. Oh, yes. Okay. Because how do you know how much, how do you know if it's worth it for you to do this product if you don't know how much it costs you to make it? Right. You can't, you can't sell it for whatever you want. And, again, I used to be a consultant for the city of San Francisco for those trying to get products into the stores. And I always ask people, okay, well, how would you come up with that price you're selling your product for? And 98%, 99% of the time, they pull that price out of the sky. Oh, well, that's for every, most business owners, you know, I'm, I do the consulting, the financial strategy with business owners, and all their prices are pulled out of mm -hmm. the sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they and, don't, they're not backed upon your ingredients. They're not backed upon no. the labor, the marketing, the packaging. Not, they don't yep. even know what that is. And, <laughs> and that will come back to bite them in the butt at some point. Okay. So first thing you do is you go to an accountant and you find out how much it costs you to make your product, which will also determine what you need to do to make the money you want to make. you got to determine how much money you want to make. Do you want to do this as a hobby and just make a little few dollars on the side? Mm -hmm. Or if you're making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year and you just want to replace that money? Or do you want to go for the goal? And shoot for the stars. You want to make millions of dollars. Right. But you've got to know what it costs you to make the product so you know which of those categories you fit in so you know what you have to do. You may not want to do what's needed to make a million dollars. You right. may decide, oh, my God, i got to sell 10,000 of these pies a month to make $20,000 a year. You may, not, you may not want to do that. And does he help you also decide... Um, because a lot of people, especially if they cook, they may have two or three specialties. Does he help you also, he or she, help you decide what's more feasible or to work on one product of, at a time or two, three, four, or try to get your whole line in? Or is he helping guide you and consult you in that direction as well? Well, an accountant is an accountant. Yeah, he's about numbers. Okay, and the numbers don't lie. Right. The numbers will tell you, okay, you really need to be trying to make 20 grand a year with these pies versus no, don't, no. Even with three items, you're not going to make a million dollars uh, off of these three pies because your markups are not going to be big enough. Plus, you've got to be aware of what your competitors are selling product for. You might have a specialty item. Yeah, you have a specialty item. So, like some folks say, 
Make a specialty item. You have to worry about how much it, it costs. No, you still have to worry about how much it costs because if it's the highest price item sitting on that shelf, unless you've got a hell of a marketing plan, right? people are going to look at that price. And, well, oh, that's great. A purple sweet potato. No, but that's that's five dollars more than uh, these other purple sweet potatoes. Right. I'm not gonna buy that. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I first got to L.A., I got my product in the Superior Grocers, mm-hmm. which is a Latino-oriented store. Right. But because they're in the inner city, a lot of African Americans shop there. Right. Exactly. So my salad, my three-pound tub, is sitting on the shelf in those stores, right next to the. Um, um, less expensive salads. <laughs> I'm being diplomatic again. <laughs> right. Okay. And we would do food demonstrations in the stores and everybody would love our salad. I mean, they'd love it. The Latinos, everybody. Mm-hmm. But then when it came time to buy and they would go to the shelf and they'd look at my product and the price and then they'd look at the price of the cheap stuff. And they were taking the cheap stuff. They were taking the, the, cheap, the cheap stuff. Wow. So that made me know yeah, you can sell your product, let's say, at a premium, but that means you can't sell it everywhere. And in today's environment and demographics, if if you've got a specialty item, you better have it selling at a specialty item store. Because if you go into any of the non-specialty item stores, you're going to get killed price-wise. Okay. Okay. So you got to go to that accountant, accountant, make sure you get your numbers straight. Um, then you figure out what you want to do. Then you go talk to an attorney to make sure that you're covered legally because people sue. Right. Oh, yeah. And it's a food. It's a consumable. So, you know, someone could be allergic to something that you have within there. They don't even know that they're allergic to it. Um, and they could get sick and then they're going to sue you, right? Yeah. Plus, there's a lot of crooks out there who just sue. Just sue. Oh, yeah. And then, so now, if, because we talked about this, and my cousin just asked me about, she, she missed that part. We were talking about you can't copyright or protect uh, or trademark your actual, well, you could the recipe, right? Uh, you could, but they, but they it can doesn't, beat that easily. It doesn't yeah. differ too much. I mean, it's potatoes, it's eggs, it's mass, what is it, um, mayonnaise. Mustard. My brother-in-law makes it. Mustard. Onions. Some people use mustard. Some people use sweet pickle. Some people use dill pickle, uh, thyme. It yeah. just depends on where you grew up. So you, yeah. so you really can't protect the recipe, right? Right. And then, okay, you use black pepper in Europe. Someone uses white, white pepper. White pepper. Right, exactly. So plus, it changes the whole. Yeah, plus you don't want to get into a legal battle over something like that. I mean, that's that, it's not worth it. So, so you're really going to talk to them about one, making sure to protect yourself from the fact that it's a consumable project product, right, mm-hmm. or consumable, and then your brand. Yeah, yeah. Um, plus, you, you've you've got to. You got to understand the world you're getting into when when you go into the wholesale food business. Um, anything can happen. I mean, you hear about recalls all the time. Exactly. Okay. Which can put you out of business. Oh yeah, very <laughs> easily. Um, and you've got to you got to understand um, the legal system. <laughs> I don't mess with the legal system. Right. The legal system is crazy, okay? I'm going to well, say cause it. Well, because it's, it's driven by money. It's, it's the attorney, and then it's driven by money because it's the consumer, and they want what they want. Um, in fact, it's interesting you said that. There's a. They were actually cli- – they were – in my one of my business plan classes, two young ladies, amazing. They were just uh, venturing into the entrepreneur space. They had gotten permission from Bluebell Ice Cream. You've had Bluebell oh, Ice Cream, oh, right? I love Blue Bell Everybody Ice. Oh. in the South, oh. Bluebell. And they're back. Huh? They're yeah, back. they're back. So they, you know, and Bluebell is a is a family owned business, and out of they Texas. protect out of Texas, and they protect their distribution like it's like his platinum mm-hmm. gold, right? Mm-hmm. So they were able to t- convince him to allow them to be a distributor out here. And I think I know who you're talking about. You know about. what I'm talking about, right? I know who you're talking and about. And they came, They that was their only product. And they were able to, they were selling their 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 ice cream 
with uh, Randolph Smokehouse. He, mm-hmm. he, he mm-hmm. became their mentor and he let them sell it on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Well, about two, uh, and I mean, had people lined out the door because everyone from the South who knew Bluebell ice cream knew that they couldn't get it here. Mm-hmm. People actually took trips to Texas and Arizona mm-hmm. in order. They would pack up their coolers <laughs> and their, their hot dry ice and drive to Arizona to buy their Bluebell mm-hmm. and quarts of it and keep it in the refrigerator. <laughs> they were ecstatic when they found out uh, that uh, uh, Loretta and Lena actually had the ice cream mm-hmm. here out the door every time they were there. But then there was a problem. Mm-hmm. I think they found some sort of bacteria, salmonella, salmonella, or whatever, and something. shut the whole. And and so the company shut down all distribution, and that really put them out of business. Well, yeah, and actually, I think they found it twice. They found yeah. it the first time, and they kind of. Got away with it, and then next thing you know, they found it again. Yeah, they so, had to go in and buy all new equipment manufacturer to manufacture yeah. and produce the product. The, and that was it. They couldn't hang on because that was their only product line. Yeah, and and they that stuff was so good. But it just goes to show you, and even as good as their stuff was, you got to think, wait a minute, California is the number one supermarket area of the country. Right. Why wasn't it out here in the stores? I, I never understood that. I think I, I I don't know. I didn't understand it. Maybe because of the legalities of it. I don't know. Business. I, business. Business. My point is, a lot of people want to go into the food business because people have told them how good their food is, how good it tastes. Right. But obviously, if something as good as Bluebell can't get into the California market, then obviously it must be about something other than how good your food is. Yeah. So what is that? Do you know what that is? It's business. It's it's negotiations. It's deals. Um, for instance, Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola may pay a supermarket thousands of dollars every quarter uh-huh. to put their product in at prime spot on the shelf like right. eye level right where everybody when you walk in the store most people look at eye level they don't see products down at the bottom or way right, up because everything the top. is strategically placed for oh, a yeah. reason that's not by accident right exactly so when you got the big boys and you have the big boys in california supermarkets they're paying the stores some of them are paying the stores to get those strategic spots and you can best believe the big boys in california ice cream industry they know about bluebell so I dare say there is something. Yeah, going it has on to there be because they got something like, like uh, what is it, Bunny Blue, which is not the no not nothing names. nothing compares to Bluebell ice cream because it tastes like homemade ice cream, and I don't care. It tastes like it, it, not just homemade ice cream. It tastes like homemade ice cream that your grandmother or mm-hmm. your mother. With the, with the, remember the churner? Mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys had the churner. My salt. mother was the mm-hmm. salt. And even when we had the electric one, but it's still nothing about the ice cream, the churner, and the whatever. So it tastes <laughs> like, and it brings back those memories of my mom and my grandmother because and my grandfather. That's actually where my mother got the recipe from was from my grandfather. Mm. Mm. And every time I tasted it, it's like, wow, it sent me, r- r- I mean, just flying back to when I was a child and, and the whole experience. Because for us, Making ice cream was an experience. I don't know about mm-hmm. your family. I'm sure it is. Mm-hmm. But it was, you know, to get the salt. It was just an experience that we had with and the licking the the, the little beater <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> I, see you, I brought back memories for you. <laughs> uh, and that's how we felt about it. And when you every time you had a taste of Bluebell ice cream, that's the experience oh, yeah, that, that I always remember. Oh, that stuff that's is good. like crack. <laughs> <laughs> it's crack ice cream. <laughs> we were we we're quite depressed that they are no longer distributors. <laughs> yeah, well, they may they may get back because I understand they're they're in other parts of the country. They're they're gearing up slowly. Okay, in other parts of the country, but they've got a battle. It's like uh, what's it, Chipotle? Yeah, where and even Jack in the Box years ago, where people ate some of that stuff and died. Yeah. That becomes a huge marketing deal yeah. to convince people to come back into your stores and buy your product. Exactly. Bluebell's going to run into the same thing where right. it's like, yeah, as good as your stuff is, but allegedly people died eating your product or uh, there was something in there that, that could kill people, whatever. Right. So it made people very leery about oh, having yeah. it. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, maybe to die. So let me ask this question. 
you obviously have a distributor. Yeah. Have you, a manufa- that actually manufactures your, your potato salad. Mm-hmm. So what was the process for you identifying that right one that fit in that price? So I, I imagine that price point was based upon your sitting down with an account. Well, you're an accountant, account. so you, yeah. get, you got that. You understood yeah. that. So did that help you make the decision on who your oh, manufacturer yeah. was or gonna, was going to be? Yeah. Well, the number, the number one thing that influenced me was I, I, I started – I started in Oakland, and I was renting a commercial kitchen. Okay. And I was sharing the commercial kitchen. All right. And the woman, I can talk about her because she's in Oakland. She's not in L.A. Okay. (laughs) Uh, We were splitting the kitchen. You know, someone had it for six hours, then someone came behind them for eight hours, whatever. Mm -hmm. And everybody was supposed to clean up behind themselves, so the person coming next after you would start off clean. Right. You can imagine that. Right. But what really was the thing— she brought in a dog food company that was making dog food. Oh, wow. Now, realistically, dog, humans can eat dog food. Right. I mean, it's food. I mean, products, it is, right, exactly. Realistically. But just the thought wait a minute. <laughs> this woman's brought in. Your, your potato salad being made in the same kitchen that the dog food made? Yeah, that, yeah, might, be a mar- like, that might be a marketing uh, nightmare. <laughs> so I, I was telling a friend of mine about it, and he knew. And here comes networking. Okay. He knew someone who was the secretary of a lady who owned a salad manufacturing plant okay. in the Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. And his good friend's wife was the woman's right hand person. So he introduced me to her. We sat down and we talked. And I'm picking her brain, trying to figure out, okay, well, how does this work? Mm-hmm. And the light went off. It's like, wait a minute. I won't have to make salad anymore i can pay someone else to make it i don't have to deal with 10 employees in there coming in late and uh crying because of their personal psychological baggage they're carrying (laughs) and all this other i'm like i don't have to deal with that anymore oh yeah i'll pay this company to make it for me so i met with them they took my product on and my whole business changed my whole life changed because i wasn't in the commercial kitchen 14 hours a day making potato salad. I had someone else I was paying to make it. Okay. Now, you've got to tie them up legally because you got to give them your recipe. Okay. So now you got to protect the recipe because somebody else is producing your product. Yeah. Which they could actually create themselves if it, there wasn't any. They so what is that? Is that a, that's not a, is that a copyright? That's a trademark? What is that? Uh, a patent? You, There's not a patent. No, but you can get a... Um, What's called a uh, non-disclosure, non-compete agreement, okay. a legal agreement. A legal, okay. Are they agreeing not to copy your recipe and not to compete with you with a similar type product? Okay. Um, it happens in the food industry all the time. And it, it actually makes sense. Again, when I was a consultant for the city of San Francisco, so many people, oh, no, I'm not giving up my recipe. No, I'm not. No, I'll make my own. No, no. A couple of years later, I get a phone call. Uh, Bill, who who did you say can make my product for me? Because it's tough. It's tough making. You got to buy all the ingredients. You got to buy everything up front. Da, 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 da. But if and you that, work, and that's because if you're in a supermarket, then you're producing. How much did you volume? Have? Volume, volumes, right? millions of pounds. Do you sign a contract to say I'm gonna produce? I don't know, twenty cases a week or no. a month or how do you do that? No, you don't. You don't get a contract. The oh. people who get the contract are the big boys, the Pepsis, the Coca-Cola, the General Mills, Kellogg's. Those are the guys who get the contract. Little guys, <laughs> your contract is as long as your product sells, they may keep it in. That's your contract. Oh. Period. That's it. That's it. And they have the right to call you <laughs> at the last minute. In order, uh, well, Bill, we need a uh, hundred more or uh, five thousand more pounds of your salad in two days. So, are you? Do you already have that made up, or are you now going into the kitchen and producing that? Well, if you have what's, what's what we call a co-packer, which is a company manufacturing for you, uh-huh. who is able to produce ten times as much as you could produce on your own, right? They're set up to handle that kind of stuff. But you've got to negotiate all that with this co-packer up front. Okay. Because the co-packer, if I'm the co-packer 
And I'm bringing, I'm bringing on Crystal's hot sauce. Right. And Crystal has, let's say Crystal has one neighborhood market that's selling her hot sauce. Mm-hmm. Five bottles a week. Mm-hmm. It's really not worth it to me to take you on because I'm going to spend all my time and labor and electricity and everything making Crystal's hot sauce, and she's only selling 10 bottles a week. It's not worth it. Yeah, right, exactly. It costs them more to produce it. Exactly. Right, exactly. But if you're Crystal's hot sauce and you're in Albertsons and Smart and & Final and Safeway and all these stores and you have volume already, mm-hmm. then me as a co-pack is going to look at you differently. It's like, oh, wait a minute. She's already established. She already has ongoing business. So, yeah, we'll take her stuff on. But then you, Crystal, have to negotiate with that co-packer a price that they're going to charge you to make your stuff. Again, it's where the accountant comes in. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what it costs you to make your stuff, (laughs) how are you going to negotiate a price with the co-packer? Right, exactly. So, again, that accountant. And with all due respect to my fellow accountants, most accountants don't know the industry specifics of the wholesale food product, what's involved. They know much more than you know. Right. But there's industry specifics that even they don't know. But they can do estimates and projections and all that mm-hmm. to help you. So you go in there and you, you negotiate with this, with, with this co-packer. And here's where the lawyer comes in. You got to make sure you're covered legally. What if product gets rejected by the supermarkets? Or what if, like my deal, my co-packer and my deal with my co-packer in California is different than my deal with my co-packer in Birmingham, Alabama? Mm. Okay. What if a product gets rejected by the supermarket because the packaging was dirty or the packaging was messed up? Mm. And that's the co-packer's fault. Okay. But the co-packer may not acknowledge that that's his fault. So where's the quality? So how do you do the quality control of that, You got to negotiate it in your contract up front. Okay. Okay. What if the co-packer decides, okay, well, Bill, um, no, you decide, well, I'm going to give Albertsons 20 cents a pound off on my salad to put it on advertisement. Okay, which attracts people. You knock the price down and Albertsons will put a sign on your product saying uh, 20 cents off or 30 cents off or whatever. Mm-hmm. And everybody's looking, always looking for a deal. So right. that attracts people. Right. Okay, so you think, okay, if I'm going to give Albertsons 20 cents off a pound, I'm going to make more money because Albertsons is going to order more because they know they're going to sell more, mm-hmm. which means the co-packer is going to have to make more a salad. So he's going to make more money. And I'm going to make more money. Mm -hmm. So you would think, well, shouldn't the co-packer participate in that 20 cents off you're giving Albertsons? Not necessarily. Okay. So you got to negotiate all that stuff up front. And to be honest with you, people don't know this stuff unless you've been in the industry. Right. And like myself, like you were saying, I have an advantage because... Because you're an accountant. I'm an accountant. Right. You know. And, and not just accountant. You also work for the city of, of I mean, the city San of San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Within those negotiations. Because, you know, I, I you know, I get the whole pricing and, 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 and understanding how much it costs you to produce your product. But what you're saying, unless you've been in that space or even knew that that was there, that you even had to think about that when yeah. you were negotiating your contract. Yeah. And something else you just said. So... If you have a, co- a co-packer, and that's what they call the mm-hmm. manufacturer, here in the state of California, do you have to have different co-packers in different parts of the country no. if you're selling? No. So it could be the one person, but that's some of the things you're looking for, obviously, when you're looking for a co-packer, right? Well, yeah, but the reason you want co-packers in different areas of the country, it depends on your product. Shipping ah. is a deal breaker. Cause what's the cost of that? <laughs> And if you're shipping, like, if you're shipping cans of tuna or cans of soup, shipping is not that big a deal because it doesn't have to be refrigerated. And that stuff will last three years. So you can ship it the cheapest shipping, the slowest shipping possible. But if you've got a perishable item like New Orleans Creole potato salad, (laughs) 
which has a, a, sh- a shelf life, a short shelf. Well, it's not short, but I've got to get that product to, like right now, we just signed up Texas, Albertsons, Texas, and I've got to get that product to, I think it's Dallas. We have to make it, let's say, on a Monday and make sure it goes out that Tuesday so we get, by the time it gets to Dallas, it's got the maximum amount of shelf life. And the cost, it has to be refrigerated. You know how you turn on your car, yeah. you get in your car and you turn on the air conditioning <laughs> yes. and it burns up all no that gas? gas. Same, Same thing, thing with a food truck. So that costs you more as far as the, the, the delivery exactly. of that. So, wow. And, and so let me ask that question. Um, for those of you that are just tuning in, if you want to see the entire show, go to morrismedialive.com and you can see Bill himself telling me all this wonderful information. So this is more a, a instructional show today because for those that are out there that, that have a product, especially a perishable food product, this is how you get to market. So you got to know all of these little details. Yeah. And you know, and I, I owe it to my community and I lose a lot of friends and acquaintances by doing this because, again, people come to me wanting to get their products into the stores. Why? Because people tell them how good it tastes. And this, oh, this is so great. Oh, you, oh, this should be in the stores. You're going to make a fortune. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I could give them the Hollywood version of the story about, oh, yeah, my stuff is in the stores, right. fastest selling. <laughs> da, 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 da. But what was the backstory? How did exactly. that, all of that take place? Right. If you don't handle the business in, you, you just won't make. I don't care what you're selling. I don't care. If you don't handle that business in, you're not going to make it. It's, and it's about business and it's cutthroat and it's backstabbing and it's tough, but it's doable. It's- but you have to understand it's about business it's not about how good your food tastes better example let's say this this is what it takes to get in the food industry this much stuff Uh uh-huh how good your food tastes is that that's that much that's significant all the rest is about business let me ask this question because that brought up a, a interesting point um the shelf life so how did you determine is there guidelines that say, I mean, I understand because potato salad has mayonnaise in it and has, you know, those products that perish very quickly. Mm-hmm. But um, are there regulatory requirements that you have to? No. No? No. Not in the food industry? What determines your shelf life is, number one, the supermarket is going to, when you go in there to present your product to the supermarket, and that's a whole other topic about who do you present your products to at the supermarket, um, when you tell them how long your product lasts, if I'm sitting here and my pie lasts 14 days, okay, you come in and present the same pie to the supermarket and your pie lasts three days. And the supermarket's thinking, well, wait a minute now. Which one has the best chance of lasting the longest? The one that lasts 14 days or the one that lasts three days? Ah, uh, and how much more profit, how much money are they going to make off exactly. of that? So they're going to go with the 14 days because that gives them a broader, longer. Exactly. And then also, you have to think, and again, the accounting part comes in again. Mm-hmm. Okay, if I'm shipping my product or if I'm delivering my product to the stores, because some people deliver their product to the stores directly themselves. Some ship directly to the supermarket's warehouse. Um, some sell to distributors and then the distributors distribute it to the warehouse. But if you're, and especially if you're a small company, they'll probably start you off delivering your own product to the stores, each individual store. Okay. Think about it. If your product lasts 14 days, okay, you have to go to the store every 14 days to replenish it. Right. You hope you go quicker than that because that means it's really selling. Right. But if your product lasts three days, you're running back and forth to that store all every the time. All the time. And that's cost. That's costing you money. Right. Every time you running, running, running to and the stores. Does that mean if you got to go every three days, that means you're in constant production? Exactly. Right. All so that that's costs. cost, right? All so, that But in 14 days, it gives you a window to breathe. Exactly. In. Ah, good point. So business plans are essential in this marketplace. <laughs> well, they are, but even more essential is f- a f- an accountant. And a food consultant who's been there before. Because, again, a lot of this stuff I'm, I'm telling you is, is what I call industry-specific information, where unless you've been in that industry, like they say, you don't know what questions to ask. 
So you did this by a um, trial and error. Trial and error, trial right? Because right? you had to, and I'm sure you lost money in that oh. trial. <laughs> How many hours is this show? <laughs> so so you lost money because you had you didn't have a consultant. Yeah, because I, you I didn't, didn't have a mentor or someone to guide you in that process. I, I didn't I didn't know anything. All I knew was my my salad tastes good. Everybody loves New Orleans food, so there's my niche. And I knew, again, because I was an ex accountant. I could I knew how to project the numbers where right. it's like, okay, well, even if God, we're not selling much this month, or we took a loss because whatever happened in the last three months, I could still project those numbers out and see. Right. Okay, well, I can just hang for the next three months. I'll be okay. Right. I could see that. You okay. But but, it, but you had the skill sets, the accounting background to even know that. So here's another thing that you said it in the Hollywood version. And the Hollywood version was the fastest selling product. Which means you have to keep up with being the fastest selling product, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So that means you are producing all yeah. the time. <laughs> well, and that's that's where the co-packer came in, <laughs> right? Where when I when I first started with, I think it was Albertsons in Northern Cal, and let let me change the names. All right, I don't want to get in trouble here. Okay. Okay. When I first started in the supermarkets in Northern Cal, I went to one of the big chains. And I presented them my salad. And I know they looked at me like, who's this little guy coming in here with potato salad? <laughs> now, let me ask you, well, I'm going to interject one question. Did you pinpoint the stores that you were going to? Did you did you say, OK, I think I will do well in Albertsons. I do well in John, Vons or John's or what have you. Or did you just go out there and say, I'm, I'm taking my potato salad out on the road and whoever buys, <laughs> I'm selling. Is that how did that work? Well, <laughs> When you're small, you have to be bold. Okay. And I'm I'm a less brown disciple, a okay. motivational speaker. <laughs> Got it. Oh yeah. And what does he say? What you're trying if what you're trying to do is un unbelievable, no unreasonable. Unreasonable. And what a, what I was trying to do was unreasonable. You know, little guy trying to get potato salad into the big supermarkets, then you have to be unreasonable. Right. Okay. Okay. And you have to think like that. So I'm bold. I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna go straight to the big supermarkets. <laughs> you didn't even go to the little bodegas, no. uh, little no. neighborhood markets. You wanted to go straight. I to went the top. straight to them, and and that was a mistake. Let okay. me say that for the audience. That's a mistake. Okay. Okay. But I went straight to them, um, and I can't remember why the supermarket chain even gave me an appointment, but they gave me an appointment. And, but they tasted the salad, and they're like, whoa. And so they called everybody in from different departments and whatever. Oh, really? Come so taste they were, this. So, okay. Oh, yeah, because they were shocked. And they were like, whoa, whoa. So I'm thinking, oh, shoot, I'm in. <laughs> but I didn't know. You know, I didn't know how the game was played. Uh huh. So next thing you know, they're telling me, uh, okay, well, Bill, we're going to get back to you in a few days, and we're going to get something started here. So a few days turned into... A few weeks, a couple of months, and I didn't hear anything from them. They weren't calling me back or anything. Okay. And fortunately, I knew a guy, another ex-accountant, who knew uh, one of the district managers at one of the supermarket chains. Networking. Connections. And, yep. And he told, I said, man, they're, they're sitting on my salad, man. They won't tell me yes or no. So he said, well, let me talk to my buddy who's district manager. So cut a long story short. They called me and they said, Bill, come in. Um, we want to talk to you about your salad. And I'm like, oh, all of a sudden, just like that. <laughs> so I went in and they said, okay, Bill, we're going to give you five stores to test your salad. And they picked the stores. And they picked them all over Northern California, all different areas. And you had to do the self-delivery. Oh, yeah, you had to do the self-delivery. And they don't pay you. They didn't pay me while they were doing this. But one thing I, t I told them, I said, okay, you guys. I'll do that, but you got to let me go in and demonstrate my salad. Okay, so and you I, knew enough to do that. Oh, yeah. And okay. see, again, I used to be what they call a barker or a doorman <laughs> on Bourbon Street in New Orleans <laughs> growing up. You, All skills that were very rela uh, relatable, right? Uh, <laughs> Relative to I you. Mean, there weren't many to jobs. To your boldness. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many jobs in New Orleans. You took what you could get. Right. So I grew up 
knowing how to sell New, or- New Orleans to non-New Orleanians. Because everybody come down in the French Quarter, most of them were tourists. Right. Now, of course, I was selling something a little different on Bourbon Street. Right. But I just had to clean my act up a little bit to sell potato salad here. Right. The first store, they told me, Bill, you take three weeks worth of salad to these five stores. Let's see how you do. Okay. All the five stores I went to, they sold three weeks worth of my salad in two hours. Oh, my God. Two hours. That stuff was flying out of the stores. And they thought, okay, all right. That might have been a fluke. So they said, <laughs> okay, Bill, let's do it again. Uh-huh. And it happened again. It just kept happening and happening. And finally, what happened was the, the supermarkets are separated into districts. Okay. And one district that I was in those five stores told another district, we got this great potato salad here. You guys need to check it out. So all of a sudden, all these district managers are calling that one district and then calling their headquarters saying, we want that New Orleans potato salad. That stuff's selling like crazy. Wow. So it just took off. Again, Hollywood version. Right. Took off. Next thing you know, my salads in all these stores. But see, I knew they were just trying to get rid of me by giving me that test. Put uh-huh. me in those five stores. Right, so you could fail. Oh, yeah. Just trying to get me out of the way. But they didn't know who they were messing with. <laughs> <laughs> it was the disciple of... Uh, <laughs> Les Brown. <laughs> hey. Les Brown. <laughs> yeah, shoot. So. Wow, wow. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back and let Bill continue to dazzle us and share his experiences in getting the Creole potato salad to market. And we'll be right back. Hello, meet Larry. Larry is a general contractor. Larry is very good at his craft, but Larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients' needs. Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186. And... We are back and welcome back to the Business Zone. You, if you're just tuning in to us, we are here having a conversation with Mr. Bill Washington, who is uh, the Creole potato salad man. And he's ex- telling us his experience on how he got into retail supermarkets and the process that goes with that. And I am just impressed because, you know, I've been teaching people how to run businesses for many, many years and not too many of them. Every now and then I get, I come across an entrepreneur that has an aspiration or has a product, but they're looking at getting it in. They're actually looking at opening their own stores Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. sell their product versus using it and and trying to get it to the retail marketplace, mainly because they seem like, I don't think they know what the steps are. So it seems like, 
unreachable or unattainable? Yeah, but then also, and again, back to accounting. I've I've seen restaurants who want to get their products into the store. Some of them actually got their products as far as the buyer at the supermarket who makes a decision as to whether your product goes in or not. Right. But they didn't, the restaurant is used to selling their products retail. But when you sell to the supermarkets, you have to sell it wholesale because if you're selling it to the supermarket, you have to sell it to the, you have to sell it to the supermarket. You got to make your profit. Right. Then you sell to the supermarket. They've got to make their profit. Right. And then it sells to the public. Okay. Whereas the restaurants used to just marking it up and selling it direct to the public. Uh-huh. And you can't you can't do that with the supermarkets. So the restaurants see that, well, wait a minute. Now, I'm used to selling my cream de la cream for $3 a pound. But the supermarket's telling me I have to sell it to them at $2 a pound. Okay. And they don't understand or they don't get or they can't afford to sell it at that cheaper price. But they don't understand, okay, but you'll make it up in volume. Because ah. the supermarket is going to sell a whole lot more than then you can sell at sell your one restaurant location. Yeah. Right. And also, I like to call it, I mean, you think about it. If you're on the restaurant, I mean, you're you're working. Right. But if you sell to the supermarket, you put your product in the supermarket, you put it on the shelf, and at night you go home and it's still selling. Because it's exactly. sitting on the shelf so making selling. money while you sleep, exactly. right? As long as the doors are open in the supermarket. So exactly. that's, that's a better, to, to me, as far as a strategy, you're working not as hard and you're not, because they're worried about the marketing, mm-hmm. right? They're, well, well, you still got to do your own marketing. Okay, I'm going to ask you that question because they're doing their marketing and the fact that they're bringing the bulk of the people into the store. Now, how do you... From the because this is your product, so your concern and interest and is in that product, not necessarily that Vons or Albertson is doing whatever they're doing. So, what's your marketing strategies for making sure that you're driving the business into the stores where your food, where your products are are being sold? Well, in in, in my particular case, um, because New Orleans food is so popular all over the place, I first thing I do is. I go into the supermarkets and I do, I call them demonstrations, okay. but it's giving out samples. If you right. go to Costco, you see all these people yeah, in there. Yeah, that's big over there. Yeah, same mm-hmm. thing, except I put a New Orleans twist on it because my my market niche is New Orleans. Mm-hmm. If the supermarkets have about five or six different potato salads, and I get into this battle with my demo people all the time, you can't just say potato salad. <laughs> to the customers, you gotta say New Orleans Creole potato salad, because if you say potato salad, and then the customer, if they don't go right there and buy it, they go walk around the store and get other groceries, they'll forget. Right. And they'll go to the deli, and what they're gonna ask for? Potato they salad. Have, right. Not New Orleans potato salad, because I've seen it happen a million times. So that creates a niche for me during those demos, and the demos are the. Simplest thing to do. I tell everybody, if you're in the stores, you want to do a lot of marketing, but the easiest, most cost-effective one is send someone into the store and give out samples because the customers are there. They come to the store to buy food, and if they taste your product, they like it, impulse. They may buy it on the spot. Uh, But you have to give them something like a card or a flyer or a coupon so they remember it. Because, again, they go home. If they don't have something... To uh, remember your product by, they'll go home three days later. And that was a good, that was that was a good potato salad the guy had. But again, they're just saying potato salad. They're not going to remember New right, Orleans. New Orleans. So you have to make sure that they know we're talking about New Orleans bills, potato exactly. salad. Exactly. That's right. one way to do it. Another way, fairs and festivals. Mm. You do fairs and festivals. You do trade shows. You do black expos, and you give out samples. If people like your product. And unfortunately, it's a sign of how bad things are economically in our community where someone in a, let's say in the Black Expo, excuse me, is giving out samples of New Orleans potato salad or New Orleans sweet potato cookies that's in the supermarkets, mm-hmm. Albertsons, whatever. That's still news. 
because we still don't have a lot of companies with products in the stores. Yeah, that's true. So people will remember us. Like, yeah. And and it's called I call it gravy advertising in our community. But if you do a black expo and you give out products to people and you tell them it's in the Albertson Swan Final, whatever, they're going to go home and tell cousin, girlfriend, boyfriend, mama, daddy, right. everybody, you know, this brother's got this New Orleans Creole potatoes out in the stores. Girl, it's good. Mm -hmm. Now, other communities are not going to do that about our salad. No. No, because there's no reason for them to do it. No. They might say there's some good potato salad at Albertson's. But they're not going to send their friends and exactly. everybody, hey, it's Professor Karimo, welcome to the show. Yeah, they're not going to send their friends and family. And for us, when we have, you know, barbecues, I mean, a main component to any barbecue we're having is potato salad, right? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. If, and even when we go out to, you know, I know do potluck, I go and pick up potato salad. I mean, yep. wherever you go. So if they know that you're in the store, then, of course, yours would be there, you know, especially if oh, they yeah. want to make a, a, a big showing. And, you know, and, and also um, all the organizations in Southern California, Southern California is so huge and there's so many people here. You've got hundreds and I'm keeping it in our community. You've got hundreds of uh, African American organizations. Right. You got the Chambers of Commerce. You got the Black Accountants Organization. You got the sororities. And one thing they all have monthly meetings. That do they do? And right. What's at those monthly meetings at all? Food. <laughs> so you just make sure potatoes, New Orleans. Put some Creole exactly. potato salad is there, and then your marketing material. Exactly. And we also have a lot of, uh, and we talked about this ourselves at the early part of the show. We also have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, New Orleans residents or people oh, yeah. implants here oh, yeah. in the Southern California. Yeah. And they, you guys, there's a big festival every year, right? Isn't La, there? La La. La La. Yeah, yeah, they have. And then, of course, yeah. Fat, yeah, we do a lot of big celebrations for uh, uh, Mardi Gras. Um, but there's a lot of implants here in Southern oh, California tons. from New Orleans. Yes, it's interesting. The, and it's one reason why the New Orleans food in the L.A. area is good as opposed to in the Oakland-San Francisco area, it's hard to find the good New Orleans food. Oh, okay. You can find good barbecue mm -hmm. in Northern Cal because you got more people migrated from Texas to Northern Cal. Ah. For some reason, the people in New Orleans migrated to L.A. The people in Texas, and I'm generalizing, of right, course. Right, exactly. People in Texas migrated to Northern Cal, and it's just like Chicago. Chicago has tons of Mississippians. Yeah, and the soul food in Chicago is great. Oh, yeah. So you got all those Mississippi yeah, folks. Right, exactly. So it's interesting how that that turns out. But there's so many opportunities to market. But you've got to, again, better being your product being in the store than being in a restaurant. If I'm in Riverside at the Riverside Black Chamber of Commerce or in Palm Springs, Palm Springs Black Chamber of Commerce, and I have my food there and I'm telling people you can get it at the stores, there's a supermarket in their area that has it. Right. But if I have a restaurant in L.A. One place that you can send people to go. Who's going to drive from Palm Springs or Riverside into L.A. to get that product? They're not. Or if they do it, they're going to do it maybe once. So it's a big advantage being having your product in the store. So, again, the stores will pay you less, but you make it up on volume and you can reach more people. And you become known in these areas because... Even as big as L.A. is, and again, I can't, I've only found one other black, com well, there's a couple of black companies with products in the stores. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Riverside, Palm Springs, and all these places. There aren't any black companies with products in the stores down there. So your product and you become big news. Right. Even right. bigger news. Right. So it's all, it's all part of marketing. But again, you got to have that understanding that, okay, if I sell it to the stores, they're going to pay me less. But I'm going to make it up in volume and I can reach more people. But some, a lot of people just, they won't. No, I'm not selling. I'm not selling them my product at that price. That's a ripoff. But I, but again, I, and I have to come back to the fact that it's, it's the core of who you are as an accountant. Exactly. And you understand the bigger picture and not for the instantaneous uh, rewards. Now you see it on the long on, on the long haul. Oh, yeah. And that's a much better. So that's 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 really good. Um now, let me ask this. So I know you have 
the potato sa- uh, Creole potato salad. Make sure I say it the right way. Um, <laughs> there's also cookies, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I have um, we have the Creole potato salad. I have my Creole macaroni salad, which is not in the California market. We're oh, I didn't know you had that. Texas. Oh, That's yeah. in Texas marketplace. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I also have my line of New Orleans sweet potato cookies. Okay. Um, sweet potato. Again, let me be careful how I say this because there are companies that make sweet potato pies. Um, shelf life. My New Orleans sweet potato cookies, and we're about to launch them into the supermarkets. Okay, fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, but it's been a long, oh, God. Because I think when I met, first met you, you were just introducing the sweet potato cookies. So that's been about four or five years, yeah. maybe, at best. And, we, and it's just not taking that while to get it. Did it not catch on? It's a different flavor, obviously. but Well, no, it wasn't. I mean, everybody loves them. Uh-huh. But, again, the business of it. Ah. Uh, okay. Number one, cookies. You're competing against oh my Nabisco, God. <laughs> Oreo, <laughs> the Mother's comp- Cookies. <laughs> the I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. And, you know, all you have is something different than the world of sweet potato <laughs> cookies. And cookies, Nabisco and Oreo, because they're doing such huge volume, I mean, they can sell those cookies so cheap. Yeah. So you walk into the Safeway supermarket with your New Orleans sweet potato cookies and they love them and and all of a sudden you get around the price and the um, the buyer says, okay, well, Bill, how much are your cookies? And and I'm just throwing numbers out uh-huh. there. Okay, well, I can sell them to you for, uh, they're $5 a box, which comes out to like 60 cents a cookie. Okay. And, and again, me being the next accountant, I've gotten my price down as low as I can <laughs> get it. <laughs> There's okay. not a lot of fluff in your No, <laughs> no, because I know I got to compete with these right. other guys. Mm-hmm. And a supermarket buyer, you know, he's looking at you when you tell him 60 cents a cookie. And he's not saying anything. <laughs> and he's just giving you that look. <laughs> and you know what that look means. <laughs> so you figure, okay, all right, well, I'm not going to say anything either. And then he says, Bill's a great cookie. But look, and he pulls out an Oreo or a Nabisco cookie. Uh-huh. Same size as yours. Bill, we're getting this for 40 cents or 35 cents a cookie. Oh. Yours is 60 cents a cookie. Oh. I mean, he doesn't have to say any more. Yeah, because he's already it's vol- speaking volumes right there. So that's that's the first part. The second part is um, you got to have somebody to make the cookies. And when I moved to L.A., because I didn't want to, I don't, I don't make anything myself. I Contracted all out. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, one of the reasons I moved from, from Oakland to L.A. was I'm like, okay, I know I can find a bakery to make my cookies for me, co-pack them for me, because Southern Cal is so big, there's so many businesses, so many mm-hmm. people. Right. It took me over a year and a half to find a, a baking company to make my cookies for me. Really? What And what was cost or... They all had quality their, or they all had their own agenda. Okay. And some of it was well, again, you gotta negotiate the cost, what you wanna pay. Okay. And what they want to charge you. Okay. You gotta negotiate logistics, all that stuff. And it just it took that long. And by the time we got it all together, something happened with sweet potatoes. Um, like with Patty LaBelle's pie. Oh yeah. They ran out of sweet potatoes. Wow! Yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, well, that was although that was more a case of I don't think they expected her pies to take oh, off like that at pies, Walmart. And it's so funny. I have to interject one little story. My brother-in-law is an amazing cook, right? And he makes sweet potato pies every every holiday. And so we were a little we 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 had some loyalty issues about going in and buying Patty Labelle's mm-hmm. pies. So we were at Walmart. And we went, I looked at my sister, I said, what do you think? She goes, Oof, I've heard it is amazing. I it said, is. yeah, I've heard it's amazing, it too. I <laughs> said, is. and there's some people, there's some people that can throw down with mm-hmm. sweet potato pies. But Patty took it to another kind of level. She did. So we said, I said, let's, she says, let's get it. So we got it, right? So we went home. And we take we ate it. We're like, oh my! And we had to do it in secret. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and she she was like, oh my god! I thought, no, oh my god! So we didn't say anything. We left it in the house. Uh, so one day she says, 
So, you, Timmy, you think you want to try? This is Patty LaBelle's sweet potato pie. He goes, mm. <laughs> So we're like, oh, I don't know if he's going to like it. So I think he did take a little slither of it. And um, he said, she goes, so what did you think? He went, mm. <laughs> like that. Yeah, right. So, but you, but you couldn't find it. Well, again, she that's... sold out. I mean, it was only like Thanksgiving, wasn't it? Yeah, and that was terrible. Think all the money they lost. She lost, and Walmart lost. But again, as good as her pies are, and she is Patty Labelle. Right. The business side, they didn't see this coming. So they should have negotiated a contract with whoever they get the sweet potatoes from oh, okay. to make sure they could get enough. Uh, to and cover I didn't them. even know it was because they ran out of sweet potatoes. It, some it, some of it, right? They ran out. They didn't negotiate the deal to have enough in supply. Now again, it depends on who you listen to, right? But again, the business side, and also, Patty was selling the Walmart for what a couple of years before it hit. Mm -hmm. It didn't hit until that brother got on YouTube oh. and did his little oh, that, that whatever. Pie. Yeah. And I didn't even see that. I just by that time, maybe whatever had happened. I just heard it word of mouth from people who had had it. And I had gone to a couple parties and I think that's how I tasted it. I went to a party and somebody brought the pie there and it just was like the hit of the whole entire party. But until that guy got on TV, I mean, on YouTube, oh, YouTube and did that amazing. little thing, because, again, it's been in the stores. It was already there. But when he did this little thing, then all of a sudden the word spread like wildfire and people started tasting it. That's when how good the product is comes into play. Uh, but if he wouldn't have got on. Right. Did hit the YouTube for them I mean, because they went viral, basically. Yeah. And just think the, the conversations we're having. Right. How much of it has been about how good my salad is? Right. We're talking about the backside of, of the salad. And that's, and that's yes, what yes, it's, it's the about. Business side. And it's so yep. interesting you said that because I was talking to my co uh, to Jackie today, my co-director of Recycling Black Dollars, and she was at an event yesterday with uh, uh, Magic's wife, Cookie. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Cookie uh, had us jeans. She had jeans in, in the Nordstrom Marketplace. Oh, she did? Uh, she did for a quick moment they were for the curvy woman okay and so when she was talking yesterday at the pcr um event uh was the pcr yeah i think the pc uh, pacific coast regional center they had their 40th anniversary celebration she was the speaker the keynote speaker and one of the things she said was and again it comes back to business and it comes back to pricing she overpriced her 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 product mm -hmm. because here she has Jeans for the curvy marketplace. So when you think of curvy, what do you think of? I like her. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Black women. <laughs> you like curvy, huh? Black women, right? Because mm -hmm. that's us, mm -hmm. curvy. Mm -hmm. And but it was in only in North. I think they were only in Nordstroms, and they were overpriced. So if you're thinking curvy and us, yeah. then you need to put that somewhere like J.C. Penney yeah. or Macy's or yeah. Kmart or or Target because yeah. those are the stores that we're in. And if you got a Nordstrom price tag to it, that's going to be too pricey. Yeah. We're not going to spend. I don't care if we had that. We're not going to spend two three hundred dollars per pair yeah. of jeans. Not enough of us. And she people. even had the pass from Oprah. Of oh, her really? favorite things to, to, to buy. Oh. You know, usually when you get a pass from, that's who you should have gotten wow. your cookies to. Because <laughs> when Oprah co-signs, yeah. oh, it that's goes magic. sky. That's magic, yeah, right? That's magic. But because of the way it was priced, and she said, so she learned some very valuable licenses, like uh, lessons in that trial and error. Yeah. And so here you think, oh, wow, Magic Johnson, Cookie Johnson, there is no way she didn't know the yeah. business side, or at least she even could have had a consultant to say, curvy marketplace in the in the retail market means black women. Yeah. And yeah. are black women gonna pay two to three or four hundred dollars for a pair of jeans? Yeah. The answer to that is no. Yeah. You, you would you would think. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It also depends on what you're selling. Like this guy, um, uh, what's his name? Lavar Ball. His son is a basketball player for UCLA, and he's he's going to be a high draft pick oh, in the okay. NBA next year. And all those guys, 
the high draft picks, they get a shoe contract right uh -huh. away with the big shoe companies. Right. And they might make a million dollars. Just as soon as they sign with the pro team, boom, they get a million dollar shoe contract. But this guy, LeVar Ball, and he's very controversial, mm -hmm. okay? But he's decided his son, no, we're going to go to China and have our own brand of ah. uh, shoe made, yeah, uh, tennis shoe made. And the shoe companies are like, he can't do that. How is he going to do that? But he can probably do it. I mean, all these NBA stars, they're probably going to fall in line and see what he's doing because they know, wait a minute, they're giving me a million dollars to wear their shoe. They must be making billions off it. Right. But the thing with LeVar Ball is, He's pricing this shoe, he calls it Big Ball or something, $500 a pair. Right, Tennis that's more, shoes. That's more than Michael Jordan's that's shoe. triple Michael Jordan's shoe. Is that Jordan the one shoe. that's white and it's got gold? I think they were talking. No. Oh, okay. There no. was some guy today that they were talking about that. That but was you, probably it, though. But, you know, with Michael, remember Michael Jordan, his shoes go for two, $300 a pair. But then one of the other ball players that came out against him and said, Stephon I get mine from the right? Yeah, I make my tennis cheap. shoes for $5. Yeah. He get it made in the exact same place I'm getting yep. factory. Yep. And it costs him $5. And this yep. is his profit on top of that. But you know what? This $500 tennis shoe, if this guy's son, I think his name is Lonzo Ball, mm -hmm. if his son becomes a star, because he's already gotten all the attention from playing for UCLA, being a star, and then his dad has been all over TV, all over the country, talking about this stuff, and his dad is very controversial. So he's already got the public's attention. Right. I wouldn't be shocked if those shoes sell for five hundred. Oh, they probably will. And you know, there are people that will buy five hundred. Oh, yeah. they, they will do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, they so, they're not a problem. Not a problem at all. Because you know, the tennis shoe marketplace for the minority or for the men. Period. I don't even think it's just minority. No, I think it's men. Us. Period. In fact, there is a um. There, and I just caught it before I came to the show today on the news that these guys have a online tennis shoe. Mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. they I, I guess they're like shoes that they bought from celebrities mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now they're being bidded for. Mm -hmm. And it's like a billion dollar industry. Oh, yeah. The tennis shoe industry is a big, oh, yeah. big industry. It's, it's crazy the money people are making today off of some crazy things. But again... If you if you're business minded, if you understand business, I mean, most people are saying that's crazy. How did how did somebody else's dirty tennis shoes? <laughs> but if you're business minded, you're thinking, no, that's uh, because you're marketing the fact the that celebrity part. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that Shaq wore these big right. seventeen inch shoes, seventeen size shoe, but Shaq wore them. That's the value of them. Yeah. That makes the market that shoots the price up, and people are so Somewhere. into. That reality or the fame or you know, the whatever in reality ten, ten, yeah. uh, the reality TV world will help oh, perpetuate yeah. a lot of that. So, you know, if you can't do business in today's marketplace with, I mean, like you said, somebody's old tennis shoes. That's that's <laughs> called what that's called like recycling recycling a product, right? So, but it's about business. Business. It, it, it always comes back to about business. Um, I do know, and I'm gonna we, we, we need to talk about this because it's, uh, you know it's almost five forty. I mean, Ooh, wow. five forty went by quick, huh? It's always fast on the radio show. But let's talk about you and collaboration or pe businesses that collaborate. I know you have something that's going on now with the gumball, oh, uh, yeah. the gumball, uh, the lady that does the gumball, right? Yeah. So you want to tell uh, us a little bit about that and how you see that taking your business to the next level? Okay. Um, Again, so few of us with products in the stores. Um, I've only been able to find the gumbo brick. I mean, there are, there are a couple of other companies, but let's just say they're competing products. Okay. And you can't you can't sleep with the enemy. I mean, you can't <laughs> <laughs> you can't be out here sharing your secrets and all whatever with people who are selling similar products. Right. I mean, definitely. that's just business sense. But complementary products is a good thing. If they're complementary, yeah. Uh -huh. But th there's a line you got to draw. Okay. Right. And she has the gumbo brick, which is frozen gumbo. And all you do is you add the meat or seafood to it. Okay. The way it makes the way you like it. But she's right. done all the, the heavy lifting, okay, with the rule and everything else. And she has gumbo. 
And my fellow New Orleanians, Louisianans know, and not too many other people know, but one thing you do with gumbo, you eat Creole potato salad. You put it on top of the rice in the gumbo, or you put it on the plate. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, yeah, that. that's tradition. That's, oh, I did not oh, know yeah. that. Okay, wow. Learned mostly everything. New Orleans and, okay, you have to be from and New Orleans Louisianans now. know okay. that. Okay. So it made sense. And ironic, a, a crazy story. She was on Shark Tank four years ago or whatever, yeah. and her show had just aired. I didn't even see it. No, I did see it. I'm sorry. And that evening, I just happened to be in a sports bar in L.A. I had just gotten to L.A., mm-hmm. and I'm in a sports bar, and it was crowded, and there wasn't room at the, at the, anywhere. So there were you these two. the game stop. <laughs> <laughs> there were these two sisters sitting at a table, and they had an empty seat. Uh-huh. And I asked them, said, what's well, crowded? Can I sit next to you guys and watch the game? And said, sure, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Kind of long story short, that was her. Wow. Just like that, that was her. So, you know, we, we met, and it was like, wait a minute. I just saw you on TV. And she was like, yeah, I've seen you before. So it was like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to do something together. That was four years ago. Three or four months ago. We finally got around to doing something. Oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, we decided, we sat down, we decided, you know what? Let's do something together. Let's do some joint. Uh, first thing is we're going to do joint cooking demonstrations. Oh, wow. That's a good idea. Yeah. You go into the store. Um, you got the gumbo. I got the Creole potato salad. And we're going to really, people are going to really go, what? Because so she was at Costco, right? Because I think I met her brother one time. Then he, he invested some of, her brother was a ball player. I think so. I think he was involved in some kind of way. Yeah, I think I'm, he I'm did her sure. first investment to her. It wasn't a big I, I investment, that, but I but think that's how I knew that. That's even how I knew who she was. Yeah. And then didn't she sell on one of the corners? Yeah, she used to she be on the corner. corner on Crenshaw. 50, Crenshaw on 54th, and right? Some, somewhere around right, there. Right by the um, Not too far from border. Slauson. Yeah, she was by the um, a workforce. Uh, yeah, I yeah, think so. Unemployment think so. office right there, right there on the yeah. corner. Yeah, 54th and Crenshaw. So, so, um, so did you guys do it at Costco? No, no. We we just, like I said, after oh, okay. four years, we just connected again three months ago. Okay. So we've been planning on what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. We're going to go in the supermarkets where her product is and my product is. And we're going to do cooking demonstrations. And we're going to take that oh, scoop of wow, Creole potato salad and man. put it on that gumbo. <laughs> Um, we're also going to do, um, and that also cuts our cost in half because if I'm paying a worker, again, the business side, if I'm paying a worker to go in there and give out samples, she's paying a worker to go in there and give out samples. Why don't we pay the same worker to do both of ours? Ah, we cut so the cost in half. half. Right. Again, the business side. Joining in your, your expenses oh. to put, to increase your profits. Which means we can also do more demonstrations at more stores. Okay. We're also going to do the same thing at fairs and festivals. Fantastic idea. We're also going to do um, email blasts. Okay. I send out an email blast. She sends out an email blast. Why don't we just combine the two? Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. Again. Combining those efforts. And, and also we'll have more of a presence to the public where before they saw, oh, wow, oh, yeah, that New Orleans, oh, yeah, and that's the Creole potato salad, man. But now they're going to see the Creole potato salad, man, and the gumbo brick. Right. So, so now they're going to think of them going together like like br- peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> the marketing is more intense because you got two products there as opposed to one product here, one product there. Right. And again, our costs are cut. So it makes perfect business sense. It makes business sense. And always, again, what we said, it, it, we had to take the emotions out of it and, and, and look at it from a business perspective on how we can grow our businesses to reach our individual goals. Okay. Now, let me, let me say one thing, which we don't like to hear, but I'm going to say it. Okay. Um, if more of us would work together there you go. on this stuff, uh, we could have so many more businesses, so many more products in the stores, give you an example. And I, we're not going to get into why we don't, right. whose fault, whatever, whatever. But it's our responsibility to do something about You're it. You're absolutely right. This is 2017, right. okay? I was in Rhode Island uh, presenting a product to a supermarket chain. This was years ago. Uh-huh. And who walks in but another friend of mine 
who sells to the supermarkets. This is in the, we were both from Oakland at the time. And they walk in to do the same presentation the same, the same day, half an hour apart. <laughs> Now, we both spent all this money traveling to Rhode Island from California to present the product. The presentation is not going to take no more than 10 or 15 minutes. Right. Spent all that money when all we had to do was, well, wait a minute now. Why don't we both hire a broker and let that broker, one broker, travel to Rhode Island and present our products? Oh, big makes big sense? It oh. makes all sense in the world. And it, well, well, nobody can sell my product like I can. But look, how well you sell your product is not that much different than how a broker is going to sell it. Because a broker knows all the, the key points and the flash words and everything that that supermarket buyer wants to hear. Exactly. So it's like. And it takes the emotion out of it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, look at all that money we spent. But it went in one ear and out the other. Now, how, how many, um, and I, you and I had this conversation the other day when we saw each other. Are there many People in our communities that are that have products that could go to wholesale, like oh yeah. So oh. well, so. they have food they cook <laughs> that could sell in the stores, stores. But that's different than having that product ready to sell in the store. Because we were saying earlier, packaging. Yeah. For instance, my potato salad, my Creole potato salad. If I just sold it. It's potato salad. Potato salad is not a sexy, jazzy product. If I just sold this potato salad, I used to sell this Mother Deer's potato salad. Oh. Cute name up in the San Francisco uh -huh. Bay Area. Cute name. Nobody paid attention to it. <laughs> Until you put the Creole in front of it. I changed it. It's like, wait a minute, Bill. You're from New Orleans. Everybody's always asking you about food. Call it New Orleans Bill Creole potato salad. All the difference in the world. And what's that? Marketing and packaging. packaging. Right, exactly. Also... Costing. We talked about this earlier. Yeah, you can you can put all the ingredients and secret spices and everything you want in that product when you make it at home. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to sell it to the store and they're going to beat you up price wise, you're not going to walk in there and just sell it to them at the price you want. Right. Because you've got you got to make a profit. The store has to make a profit. Um, you got you should hire a broker right. who's got to be paid. Okay. You got to have promotional dollars in your product. Okay. Okay, you got to have money in your product to give products away. Wow. All this got to be built into your cost. Okay. Now were you self-funded or did you get funding? Oh, that's a whole I know that. We're going to have um, you back on the show. And but talk let me about say this. Talent. Basically, I funded everything myself at one point I had a deal with some investors in Oakland. I was supposed to be getting half a million dollars. Never saw half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were working with a bank. I think it was doing a Community Reinvestment Act years ago. Mm. And they, it didn't happen. So okay. I basically went out of business just about, this was years ago, fooling around with those guys. Mm -hmm. And I knew them. I mean, we're all from the accounting financial world. Oh, wow. Um so I had to basically start all over again and rebuild everything up and finance everything through my pockets. I sold my house. Um, I mean, you name it. All the stories you hear about, oh, you got to sell your house. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Fortunately, I have a daughter. Well, she's grown and gone now. Mm -hmm. And she was very independent. She was in college at the time. Mm -hmm. And she found a way to get whatever money she needed for whatever she wanted. She went to Northeastern University in Boston. Mm -hmm. So she found housing. She found grants. She found loans. Everything. Mm -hmm. So all I had to do was focus on the, the business. business. Okay. And without that, I, I never would have made it. Uh, she also, if I get in dire straits, you know, she'll help me out. Okay. Okay. But in terms of getting money from the from the banks... Uh, we'll move on to the next subject. Okay. All right. Yeah, I wanted to ask that, and I had a reason, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, here's the something, and I'm going to say we got about 10 minutes left. I want us to do some workshops together. Sure. Because uh, I think um, I've been doing business plan workshops and, and that stuff, or that those type of seminars for a long time. I think more specific and being able, and I can, we can actually, between myself and Gilbert, we can identify people that have products, mm -hmm. and we'll bring those individuals that are, they, they've already developed their products. 
but they don't know how to get to mm -hmm. where you are. Uh, that's one thing I would love for us to do. The price costing, I, that's so huge uh, for oh, yeah. anyone that has a product or a service. Um, I think that would be fantastic. I charge for my classes. They're not free, so this is not a volunteer service program. <laughs> it's about making money. <laughs> it's about making money, my brother. Business. <laughs> it's about business. business. And... Um, so I want to do that. And, um, and uh, obviously you're a consultant. So I want to make sure people know that you're out here. Mm -hmm. We in our community have to look at doing business the way you've been doing business. Uh, I think that's how we get to that next level. Yeah. And, and the only way we can do that is come out of our mom and pop kind of mindset and get into doing business the big way, the bigger getting your product to to market. What does that look like? And there are many more. I know in at, Tar uh, at Target, there's like a whole department now of African American beauty supplies products. Uh, we're actually more represented there in some cases than we are even in the beauty supply stores. That now, who owns them? Because you know the Koreans, the Koreans own the African American beauty supply. Well, business. these are these are privately owned. These are companies that have been starting over the years. In fact, yesterday I read there was a CEO of a new product line, uh, not new, fairly new, black product line. He pulled his product off the shelf at a Korean beauty supply store because he didn't like the way they're treating our when we go into the store. But that's a, that's a storyline, all another show on itself. There, because yeah. the beauty supply marketplace right now is ours for the taking. Uh, they're, 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 people in different parts of the country that are making a tremendous impact in that. I, there's a young man that's in the Atlanta area. He has 90 black. He's a professor. He actually teaches his students how to be in business and it's a beauty school. So he has 92 beauty supply stores that are black owned. Really? He takes his students and places them in and they become franchised. And then they actually are selling the uh, they're in that store and they have their uh, uh, beauticians. And in addition, he's taught them how to be business owners. That's that crazy. area and the Korean marketplace is where they've had their reign, but their children do not want to take over their uh, stores. So they're having to sell. Uh, so all we need to do is position and put together some investors to go in and make the right deal, make the negotiate the right price, and you can buy those stores. Well, you know what? There's a brother up in the San Francisco Bay Area named Sam Enon, mm -hmm. and he started oh, connecting the dots or something, organization, where he was trying to organize all these uh, black barbershops, hair salons, and whatever. And he was trying to do the same thing, to set them up as franchises and whatever. He was even in, oh, what was that movie? Some movie, I can't remember. Oh, Hair? Black Hair? The one I think with, it was. The one with, um, with Chris Rock? Chris Rock, uh-huh. He was in there, and he's been going all over the country for years trying to do something like that. I haven't talked to him in a while. Well, there's a big seminar coming up in the next couple of weeks, I think, uh, uh, Dr. George Frazier, and it's about the beauty supply industry. Really? Right now, prime for the takeover because we make up 85% of the consumer sales. $9.75 million are sold every year in that industry, and women are 95% are with the consumer base. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to do that. That's not like you have to re-educate us to go into a beauty supply. No, we know. We, we got, where are we going to get our hair? Where are we going to get our makeup? Where are we going to get our supplies? That's where we go. Yeah. So it's not even a question whether or not you got to change us and say, okay, shop at this one. No, we don't even care who's behind the counter as long as they got the products. We just need to position our investors and, and, our, and our people to move into that marketplace. Go yeah. in and, and, and there's a young, a new guy, um, name is Brian. He just bought a beauty supply store up on Century and um, I want it right across this, right across from the Target in Inglewood. Right there oh, okay. where the Costco is. Yeah. He just bought that one. There's another one opening down near Dr. Rosie's office on um, Manchester just before you get to Normandy. Uh -huh. And then there's two or three more that are open. So oh. that's a marketplace that we really, hands down, would change the community in so many different ways. Yeah, because I always thought that was 
It was an insult to us, not nothing to do with the Koreans. It's but just an, an insult, insult to us that we allow our self pride. It's like, right. we can't yeah, even... we're already there. It's not even like you got to redirect us there to shop. We're already gonna go there. I mean, there's not a woman that doesn't go into a beauty supply store at least 10, 15 times a month. That can work because who who does all the shopping and whatever food, whatever women, women, oh, right? Exactly. That could work. That could work. That could work. So now is the prime time. So just getting people geared up. But I think getting people to think of it like a business, like you're talking about versus thinking, oh, I just want my little beauty salon. No, we don't want you to have. So I've been talking to a number of of stylists that have been in the business for 20, 30 years that have some business acumen. And they're like, that's not a bad idea. I went to I was in a speaker I uh, actually was a facilitator at the Nappy Wood Hair Show, and I didn't even know that many black hair care product manufacturers even existed. Really? There's there was the whole room. I mean, quality products. Oh, yeah. So it's a it's a marketplace that we really need to address and really look need to look at how do we make it on a bigger scale. Maybe I need to look at that. I think you might. Yeah. We have to talk about that. That'll be some things we'll talk about. Yeah. But I definitely want to do workshops, some workshops with you. And uh, we can talk about whenever that. Whenever you're ready. And uh, I, I'm so excited about where you're going with the uh, Gumbo Brick Lady. And it, we oh. got about two minutes left. Anything oh. that you want to leave or yeah. um, parting words? Yeah, let me say quickly. I'm also partnering up with this this guy's name is Chef Harold. And he does food at the the USC games, the uh, Rams games over at the Coliseum. And he also feeds the homeless. Oh. And he and I are teaming up, and we're going to be feeding the homeless, and we're also going to be doing the food at the um, the USC and the, and the Rams games. And then also i got to get in a plug. Uh, my Creole potato salad is at Albison's, which a lot of you already know. You've been eating it for years. <laughs> it's in the deli, not prepackaged. Okay, but... As of the end of May, it will be prepackaged in a one-pound tub. We're changing it over. Oh. So you don't have to wait in those lines. You can just go grab it and go. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Smart and Final is still going to be in a three-pound tub. Okay, Smart and Final. And then at the end of uh, May, also, our one-pound tub will be in Vons oh. Supermarkets. Well, congratulations. Yeah. So we're, we're pushing, and hopefully pretty soon we'll have our sweet potato cookies in there, four varieties, some with pecans, some with a rum sauce, and they're different. But again, I'm, my whole thing is to maintain the legacy and the tradition of the New Orleans Creole food. It would be a disaster for that to just die. And then also, again, it's business. Also, I need to make money also. All right. Well, Bill, we are very pleased to have you on the Business Zone. Thank you so much for being a guest today. And everyone, we will uh, see you next week. Gilbert will be back in the studio next week. And this has been a great informational show. So make sure you tune in next week and share. The two, uh, The video will be up online, Facebook and Uh, before the weekend's out and please share it with everyone so we can get bill more customers so have a great (laughs) week uh remember to wish me a happy birthday for the entire month of may and we'll see you next week bye-bye happy birthday thank you hello meet larry larry is a general contractor larry is very good at his craft but larry has a very tough time managing his paperwork because he is busy taking care of his clients needs Larry just cannot find his important business documents when needed. Larry is also being passed over for bid opportunities from prime contractors because he is perceived as not ready. He doesn't know where his business license, certifications, insurance, and other key corporate documents are located most of the time. Lucy owns an auto body and collision repair shop and has been using a business management and procurement assistance program called Small Biz Pro to keep her business organized, business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. Small Biz Pro is a three-in-one cloud-based business management, procurement, and market research assistance system designed to help businesses become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. It also provides back office operation solutions for small businesses. Lucy is able to stay ahead of her competitors because she uses Small Biz Pro to manage her business daily. 
Lucy just clicks on Small Biz Pro from her tablet, mobile phone, laptop, or any internet accessible device for data retrieval, and she's got it. Lucy introduces Larry to Small Biz Pro, and now Larry is more organized and can now find all of his documents and new bid opportunities in seconds. Larry now saves $120 in labor costs for each missing or misplaced document. Just simply go to your web browser and log into smallbizpro.net and register today for a limited 30-day free trial offer. Services start as low as $1 per day. Let's put the competition out of business. Small Biz Pro. If you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. Register now at smallbizpro.net and begin saving money. Email info at smallbizpro.net or call 626-533-1186.